Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining to one more of our sustainability seminar series. This is organized by Students for Sustainability, and we are doing to raise the awareness in sustainability, and we have the support of the Office of Sustainability and Graduate Affairs. In this seminar, we will present some observations on the difficulty of the carbonizing road transport by Professor James Turner. And this seminar will focus on the major challenges involved when attempting to decarbonize road transport. I would like to introduce Dr. James Turner, who is a professor in mechanical engineer at KAUST. He has 37 years of experience in the field of internal combustion engines, and he's a specialist in the field of spark ignition combustion, pressure charging, alcohol fuels, and engine and powertrain concepts. He has published over 200 papers and book chapters in these areas. In addition to his specializations, he is interested in renewable energy and its application in transport sector. Thank you so much, Professor, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, and thank you much for, very much for the uh, invitation to present. Um, so, uh, as just been said, um, I'm really an automotive person. I uh, spent most of my career in the automotive industry looking at how to decarbonize it in the way in the wake of ever increasing legislation being raised on us. Um, so uh, that's my background. I became a professor about 10 years ago. So most mostly I'm an industrialist. So this contains several different strings to it, but it's against the background of the challenges facing the auto industry and in particular the European industry, which is really coming under the cosh at the moment. Um, the actual start of this presentation was 17 years ago, and some elements of it are still the same because the same is true now. Uh, and there were two of us that really put it together, myself and Richard Pearson. We both worked at a company called Lotus Engineering at the time, which is an engineering which, which makes sports cars itself, but it was also an engineering consultancy. So we were tasked with coming up with a strategy for meeting um, future net zero ambitions that we had at the time. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the facts and figures in this have changed in time, but the core thrust of it, when I get to it at the end, is exactly the same. So it's quite a big agenda. I'm going to have to go at pace. Uh, quite happy to talk about some of it afterwards, if anybody's got any further interest. But uh, I'm going to really start with opening thoughts. Then I'm going to make a pitch to say, actually, the internal combustion engine hasn't always been bad. Um, then I'll talk about transport, uh, both personal and uh, commercial and then the legislation, what the effect of the legislation has been, and then we'll go back to the original problem and see whether there might not be other solutions, and then I'll conclude. Now, I'm definitely an automotive guy, and in, in the automotive industry, we use heaps of acronyms. So I will probably use some without explaining what they are first. If I do, please stick your hand up and say, what does that mean? Because it's very clear to me, but obviously it's, it's very not clear to a lot of other people. Okay, so some uh, opening thoughts or remarks. Actually, most of this presentation can be summed up on this slide. And this is the essential problem that we face in society. You ask people how they feel about transport. They think, well, I think green cars are a great idea. I hope all my neighbors buy them. And that comes down to the fact that nobody really wants to give up what they've got individually at the moment. They just want everybody else to change. That is essentially it in the, in the marketplace. And that comes, and that's really because of this concept of the cost to utility ratio. So there are some technologies which have evolved greatly over time, and it's probably worth remembering the changes that have been made, certainly in the last hundred years. So in the olden days, we had what's going to appear on the left-hand side of the screen, and then we have what we have now. So let's just think about some of these. So the aero piston engine, I'm an engine guy, so this seems fairly obvious to me. But the air, aero piston engine was obviously dominant for a very long time. And then we developed the gas turbine, the jet engine, the thing that gets us around that's so efficient and so reliable compared to what we had before. Back in the old days, we had paper and calculators. Nowadays, we use computers for nearly everything. We had libraries, proper libraries with real loads of books in it. Now we have the internet that we go to to get information. And we had tethered infrastructure telephones, right? Now we have smartphones, okay? Now you can, most people in the room couldn't function without a smartphone, I can't. 
but they represent the state of the art for communication on all different levels. Everything on the left has been completely superseded by everything on the right due to a revolution in cost to utility ratio. Yeah? It gives us a lot more for the same money, or it does the same thing for a lot less money. That thing needs to move in the right direction for people to adopt it. How would you react if you were told you had to go backwards from your smartphone to only using a tethered dumb phone? You would be pretty cross because you're going backwards. And this is the thing that drives people forwards to want new technologies. New technologies only get adopted if they move from the left to the right. You do not go backwards. We could definitely come back to that in a minute. So just a few things about different things I am and not going to discuss. I'm not really going to deal with hydrogen for transport. Yes, it's a thing. It's being investigated in a lot of detail for heavy duty transport, HD, heavy duty transport, including in fuel cells. I think most people know you can use it in fuel cells, but actually it's a pretty good fuel for an internal combustion engine if you can store it and move it around. Important thing about hydrogen is you need to build an entirely new infrastructure and Basically, because we've got a disconnect in supply and demand, it's struggling now due to uh, very confused and disjointed government policies around the world. Politicians themselves, when it comes to transport, most things really, would rather believe that the future was only electric. Uh, which really means what they really want to do is get rid of internal combustion engines altogether and only have electric propulsion in the case of transport. So. I'm only going to really talk about the proposed electrification uh, pathway for decarbonisation, whether it's working, and if it's not, why not? So battery electric vehicles, BEVs. BEVs are those which only use electricity to move. That's the only thing they have. It's a pure battery electric vehicle. <clears throat> Batteries are really expensive. For a relatively large one that will get you about 400 kilometres, if that, it's going to cost over $10,000 to make a battery that will store that much energy. Uh, and then you have to put the cooling and control systems on top of that. You compare that to the equivalent thing in a conventional car. The conventional car has a fuel tank for that task. And a fuel tank with everything attached to it costs less than about $250. Right? So you're talking about orders of magnitude more expensive energy storage in a battery electric vehicle. Um, Bed fires are becoming increasingly common. You may have seen that in a, uh, an apartment block in Seoul, one battery electric vehicle caught fire, destroyed over 180 vehicles at the bottom of uh, a massive apartment block. If there had been a lot of battery electric vehicles had gone up in there, it might have brought the battery, the whole block down. It's starting to get really uh, a concern, not only for obviously um, society, but also for uh, insurance companies. You know, everyone will see their insurance rates rise because of the losses associated with battery electric vehicle fires. Hybrid vehicles. So hybrid vehicles have an internal combustion engine and a battery, and they trade off the performance of one against the other. Uh, and they do give improvements in fuel consumption. They're all different types. I'm not going to go into them, but they all use an internal combustion engine. So I'm just lumping those together. When I talk about ICE vehicles, I will also be notionally including, at least in my mind, hybrid vehicles. Right, some people might want to avert their eyes now, um, but have internal combustion engines always been bad? Right, believe it or not, there were some significant health benefits to the internal combustion engine when it came in. Horses were used in cities for personal transport, haulage, mechanical power, and things got worse when the ra railroads started. You use horses with uh, towing um, trailers to move the things from the railhead to where it needed to go. And there was a, a real serious problem with the number of horses and the mess that they create in a lot of cities. Horses had a life expectancy of about two years under those conditions. Literally, they were flogged till they died where they landed, right? An initial trade in manure died out um, because there was just too much of it. You couldn't get rid of it. And believe it or not, the Times in, in London did a calculation just before the age of the internal combustion engine. And they reckoned that by 1950, so from 1894 to 1950, if the IC engine hadn't come along, every street in London would have been three metres deep in horse manure because you couldn't deal with it all. Worse than that, people, when a horse died on you, you were responsible for getting rid of it. Uh, but it didn't say when. 
So many people just left them to rot in the street. And that's a pretty horrible photograph, kids playing by a dead horse carcass, uh, because they're easier to break up when they've rotted a bit. Um, and there were some major health problems with diphtheria and other horrible things going around in cities. So when the internal combustion engine came along, everyone said, fantastic, it's much cleaner than horses. Um, and even back then, I mean, the original engines were terrible for emissions, uh, but they'd solved an environmental problem caused by the horse. Believe it or not, horse-drawn vehicles killed or injured more people per vehicle than internal combustion engine uh, vehicles, right? So they're very dangerous horses, uh, as well as being fairly, um, a fairly, uh, a fairly big health problem inside of cities. So actually, everyone looks back on this and thinks, oh, the good old days, but horses were not particularly good in big cities. Anyway. That's my pitch for engines. Okay, sustainability, transport, and materials availability. Right, so we know that transport drives economic development. And being able to move people around and goods increases trade. So the, inter the economic development was accelerated by the invention and productionization of the internal combustion engine. I think personally, and I will, I will defend this statement forever, the internal combustion engine is mankind's greatest invention. And that is because it's built the modern world. We're sitting in a closed room at the moment. You can't see any sand. You can't see any water. Everything in this room was brought here by an internal combustion engine, including the people. Absolutely everything at some point. House would not exist without it. Most, nearly all places would not exist without it. And we have to remember that whatever problems it's brought with it, it has revolutionized the world that we live in. So the internal combustion engine gave rise to transportation, not the other way around. Okay? Trying to replace it with only one thing is going to be spectacularly challenging, right? Only one thing. Everyone seems to think you can replace it with only one thing. Most of them don't. But just think about it. It's everywhere. It does jobs of work all over the place, both uh, for businesses and for individual, individuals. But the problem is we fuel it with fossil fuels. Actually, that's the other side of the equation. Fossil fuels are so cheap that they can uh, easily you know, be moved around and stored and, and they give rise to the ability to have cheap transportation. We should not blame fossil CO2 on the internal combustion engine. It is the fault of the fuel, and I will come back to this later on. There's an unfortunate mixing together of CO2 emissions with all of what we call the criteria pollutants. And these are the things which are bad that result from partial combustion. Right, like hydrocarbon, CO, NOx, and particulate matter. That suits people who would decry the internal combustion engine because everything gets mixed together. But the CO2 problem is not the same as the criteria pollutant problem. So the car and most transportation, with the exception of steam engines or steamships, I guess, has been enabled by the internal combustion engine. It has built the modern world, as I've just said. We make about or in excess of 95 million cars per year since about 2016. Do the maths, there are just over 31 and a half thousand sec uh, 31 and a half million seconds in a year. So at an average rate, mankind builds three cars per second throughout the year. Even as we sit here, three cars are finished. And most of those have already got uh, purchases uh, and, and they're not supported, most of them, by subsidies. Um, an interesting thing that came to me a while ago was actually in 2022, we built about, we had built about 2 billion cars. Right? At that point, there were about 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth. So if the cars still existed, and I know a lot of them don't, but if they still existed, you could have put every person alive in a car that we had built. Right? That's how common these things are. It's the, it's the cost to utility ratio of a car that has enabled this, and trucks, of course. Historically, the whole lot has been funded by, by private capital, either people setting up companies to make them or people buying them. It's all been private capital. The profits of the oil companies easily exceed those of the OEMs, right? OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. They are the car makers, the truck makers. We call them OEMs in the, in the business. To really make money out of this, Sell fuel, right? To sell fuel. I came into the into the into the business because I love cars, right? But if you really want to make money, sell fuel. 
Nobody likes buying it. It's a grudge purchase. If you want to go and do a journey and there's not enough fuel in your tank, you have to go and buy it. There's nothing you can do about that. So it is actually the oil companies that really make the money out of transport. Currently, there are no emissions regulations which are being talked about, which cannot be met by an internal combustion engine in a cost-effective manner. Modern spark ignition engines actually clean the air in a lot of industrialized cities. In terms of the rubbish in the front that's in the atmosphere, goes in through the engine, high temperature, out through what is effectively a chemical plant, and it gets cleaner on the way out. There's only more CO2, right? You can't do that with a battery electric vehicle. Even the particulates will get cleaned. Uh, talking about, I can see a lot of faces thinking, hmm, if you go away and look at the European legislation, by the time we got to what's called Euro 6D and Euro 7, even the diesels would do that. Right. Honda have done work on that, Nissan have done work on that, we can easily show it. Right, sustainability, we need to consider this. Let's have a definition. So basically, sustainable uh, development is essentially doing no harm for future generations, ideally. Um, that would be a very workable solution. So internal combustion engines are made with relatively low energy processes. Right? It doesn't take much to melt aluminium or steel, really, uh, from abundant and easily recyclable materials. Aluminium, steel, easily, easily recycled. But presently, we operate them on a finite resource. So they are sustainable in manufacture, but not sustainable in use. Okay. Batteries and electric vehicle components are by and large, made from rare and difficult to obtain materials that are definitely not easy to recycle. Okay. And they're operated on electricity. So they are not sustainable in manufacture, but they can be sustainable in use if you use fully uh, uh, renewable electricity in them. Okay. That's a really big point. I mean, there's a couple of slides I'll come on to in a minute. Arguably, if you could only take an internal combustion engine run it on electricity. That would be the ideal situation with regard to sustainability going into the future. And I will come back to that. Right, bad news. We have some pretty big critical mineral lim limitations. Uh, this is uh, from the IEA, the International Energy Agency, uh, published in 2020, but essentially everything still holds true. So the REEs are the rare earth elements and the PGMs are the platinum group metals, okay? So these are all the so-called green technologies that we want to develop uh, going into the future. And the black blobs are bad. The white blobs are good, gray blobs are not so good in the middle. But essentially, EVs and battery storage have the most number of black blobs in terms of what we need materials-wise uh, to be able to service what we need in the future. If we just consider copper, 700 million tons of copper is required over the next 22 years. That's equivalent to all of it that has been mined throughout history. Right? So we need to get the same amount out in 22 years. To support future technologies, we need about five times more than the known reserves. Okay, so we will have to have more of it, definitely. But five times is a hell of a lot, I'm sure you can appreciate. But my question about that is what on earth makes that sustainable? Conversely, internal combustion engines require none of these materials, right? And it's part of the reason for their economic, for their success. They're cheap. I'll keep go banging on about them. The material is, of course, relatively straightforwardly recyclable. So it's much better for the idea of a circular economy than electric, mass electrification. More bad news for anybody outside of China. So China is going to crop up quite a lot in this. China, this is from the Financial Times, uh, what, last week? Uh, or the week before, China dominates the vast swathes of the mining supply chain for batteries. China completely controls the supply chain, what we call traction batteries, the really big ones that go into electric vehicles, traction batteries. It can make battery electric vehicles as a result of controlling all of this lot for a fraction of the cost that other countries can make them. And actually, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this did not happen because of a desire to be um, sustainable and green in China. It came out of the fact that they had no oil. So they had the idea of making electric vehicles and powering them using coal-fired power stations. Right? That is where the whole Chinese uh, battery electric vehicle industry came from. And that's why they wind up buying all the stuff that has got them to this point. Right? So 
call it a lucky break, whatever you want to call it. It's the real situation that we're in at the moment. It did not come out of a desire for sustainability. Right, personal and commercial transportation. So we know there's a lot of CO2 emissions associated with transport. Tailpipe CO2 is used as the means uh, to drive technology within Europe. Tailpipe CO2 is the stuff you measure at the tailpipe when you drive the vehicle through a drive cycle. <clears throat> okay, And then you have reportable CO2 emissions. Um, <clears throat> and each manufacturer has to report how many vehicles they made of a certain type, and it all gets added up and averaged. Actually, <clears throat> as I'll talk about going in through, this is really the root of the problem. right? Globally, transport accounts for about a fifth to a quarter of, of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And it's really difficult to decarbonize because you have a large number of mobile emitters, right? Power stations and factories generally don't move much. So you can actually do stuff to take the CO2 out of their flue gases coming out the top and sequestrate it if you really want to. You can't do that on a vehicle. It's practically impossible. Aramco have done a bit of it with a truck. You can't take it all out. Not that way. <clears throat> We have about 90% dependency on oil, and there's a high rate of growth globally. So that 95 million cars is only going to go up. As more people get more money in the world, one of the first things they want is a car. Right. As long as some electricity is generated using fossil fuels, battery electric vehicles are not really zero emissions. Well, everybody says that till they're blue in the face, but you have to remember that. They're really emission shifters. They move it from one place to another place, where you hope nobody notices. So I always think of them as being emissions ventriloquists. They sort of cast the voice in a different direction. How big is the problem? Uh, global transport emitted about 8 billion tonnes of uh, CO2 back in 2018. And that's about 24% of um, CO2 emissions comes from energy. So that's how it breaks down. You can see road transport is the biggest problem in terms of CO2 emissions. How do we get to this situation? Well, it's because of the incumbent technology. I've mentioned it several times. Personal transportation is really cheap. Now, I know that when you're at university, you don't really think of cars as being really cheap. But in terms of what you get for the money, pretty cheap. right? You can buy a very, very good car for the cost. It might be secondhand, but you can buy a very, very good car for the cost of a Swiss watch. Right? And I can tell you which one of those two things has the better engineering in it. Right? It's the car. Yeah, the Swiss watch will be massively well finished and all the rest of it will look lovely and give you a real buzz when you look at it on your wrist. But a car is far, far more heavily engineered than a watch. Now, internal combustion engines become the dominant prime mover for transport because you make it from abundant materials using simple processes and it has a cheap energy storage system set $250 for the entire tank system, including the pump to get it to the engine, including the uh, canister to grab, grab the um, hydrocarbon gases, which would otherwise go into the atmosphere, including all the filler neck and everything, about $250 for that entire system. Um, you can lose that in the price of the car. Obviously, it is lost in the price of the car. What's more, the energy supply and distribution system is really efficient in terms of energy density and transfer rates, right? And we don't lose much when we move it around. It doesn't really evaporate very much. So it's all really, really cost effective and simple to do. Trying to move away from all of that will incur a significant risk to the economic model for transport, okay? Which has evolved over the years with no government stimulus, okay? At least for the internal combustion engine side of things, all been done with private capital. And we know that it works for all of the stakeholders, right? And I broke the stakeholders down into four groups. You've got the manufacturers of the car. You can see where they make money. You've got governments. And across the world, governments make loads of money from taxation on vehicles or fuel. Okay. You've got fuel supply companies. They obviously make lots and lots of money from it. Yeah. And then you've got the consumers, the fourth group. Actually, the consumers are the most important because this leads to an uncomfortable truth. Consumers have to be able to afford transportation since they're the only financial input into the system, right? Yes, we are moving away from that with some subsidies, and I'll come back to that later. But they really put all the money in. All the others take the money out, right? If they cannot afford the transport, then you've got a big problem for the other three stakeholders. Now, one other thing. Everyone says there's no silver bullet to solve the transportation CO2 problem. Personally, I'm fed up of hearing that. 
because it just seems to be something people say because they want you to believe it. Well, I hope that by the time I come to the end of this, it wouldn't necessarily be the case if we could do one thing. Right, peculiarities of the light duty, the car market. People choose cars for really odd reasons, and I'm a car fan, so all of this applies to me. You, know, you can try and rationalize things in your own mind and everything, but really, it's pretty irrational when you go out and choose a car. So very much unlike the heavy duty market where they do total cost of ownership calculations, TCO, including everything to work out whether they can afford it. Taxation policies can obviously be used to sway some opinions and influence people, uh, but they can only go so far. You know, so hybrids are a good case of that, but it very much depends on business taxation related to cars. So people, when you buy a car, you're using already taxed earnings. Sometimes you take out a loan that you service using your already taxed earnings. And that usually has high interest rates because it's a car. Uh, and they choose the car, not because of efficiency, but they do expect that. They definitely expect that. But because of things like the infotainment system, which has nothing to do with its primary function, the power output, which they can hardly use, yeah, or the image. And that's a complete intangible. And these are the things that people use to justify buying one car over another. So you spend all this money, you've earned, you spend loads more money buying it, uh, earning the money in tax, you spend the money, you get pay interest rates on that for this wonderful thing that you want, that you think is going to bring you so much more in your life. And the first thing you do with it is you leave it stationary 90 to 95% of the time. It's completely illogical, yeah? the light duty market. And accepting that it's completely illogical you cannot expect people to listen when a new technology is promised to be cheaper in the long run because they can't do the calculations to show it. You don't know how you're going to use your car tomorrow, let alone in a year's time. Right? So, uh, and then nobody, nobody does it anyway because the calculation is largely too difficult. But heavy duty companies, it's a straightforward economic calculation. So the peculiarities in the heavy duty market, there are all sorts of different applications there. A car is a fairly simple figure. You know what you want it to do. It moves people around in their daily life, really. But there are all sorts of heavy duty vehicle applications, including on road and off road. But the key thing with any heavy duty vehicle is it's only ever bought to do a job of work. Yeah. Cost effectiveness throughout its life is always considered because if something is cheaper throughout its life, it will make more money for the company that buys it. A very workable definition for a heavy duty vehicle is, is that it only makes, if you've got a vehicle and it only makes money when it's moving, that is really a heavy duty vehicle. That actually encompasses ships and aircraft at the same time, uh, passenger aircraft. It's very different to how people justify buying the cars. People with a heavy duty vehicle pay for things to be transported, whether it's people or cargo. Therefore, heavy duty vehicle has to be cheap to buy and operate and run. Beyond that, anything else is pretty immaterial when it comes to a heavy duty. So it's completely different to the car uh, light duty market. Very, very different. But they are united by certain things. Initial purchase price, energy costs, uh, the ease of energy storage and recharging it are all really important in both markets. Right. So we haven't been stationary for a long time on all of this. We've got legislation and fines. So tailpipe emissions, I've talked about that. They're measured and recorded for each vehicle type. EU legislation sets an average overall emission, over, average overall emissions threshold for cars of 93.6 grams of CO2 emitted per kilometer for 2025. That's been going down. There'll be a chart in a minute to show this. BEVs record zero. Okay, so this is the weapon to encourage people to make battery electric vehicles. It reduces the average CO2 from the fleet. Okay. For OEMs, how much are the fines? Well, they're going to be 95 euros per gram of CO2 per kilometer over the target across all the vehicles that they sold. Right. Now, you do a calculation, that is a huge number. Um, actually, it's not the same unit, I accept that, but you can put it in your own mind that in terms of the manufacturer and the CO2 that they're battling to get down, that CO2 is pretty much as expensive as gold, right? Now, it would be really good if we could just go out and buy CO2 and make money from that. It's not the same thing at all. But at least this puts it into some kind of perspective as to the efforts that the manufacturers have to make and what it costs them. 
So other major markets have, have, have limitations either in CO2 or fuel consumption. And actually fuel consumption and CO2 emissions are, are, are entirely linked by the amount, the carbon intensity of the fuel. And we'll come back to that in a minute. US has something called cafe regulation. So everybody has uh, limitations, but Europe's by and large are the most stringent in the world. So this is a historical output. So uh, uh, this guy, Mock, uh, the ICCT, did a load of uh, analysis of, uh, of, of fleets in different markets and the efficient equivalent CO2 emissions um, and to compare them all. A simplistic conclusion, because all of these markets have had legislation in the background, legislation works. Let's ramp the legislation up. The EU has the hardest targets, as I've just said. At that point, we were supposed to hit 95 grams of CO2 per kilometre, uh, and it was really considered to be the limit with conventional technology basically non-hybridized or not heavy hybridized vehicles. Uh, the EU, uh, we missed that. The reported figure for 2020 was actually 108.2 grams of CO2 per kilometer. But through a load of trading, the manufacturers managed to uh, avoid um, fines. But to go lower than 95 grams really requires a decarbonized fuel or energy carrier. Okay. Or one where the CO2 emission is just ignored. Okay. And when it comes to the legislators, that means electricity. They ignore any carbon associated with the production of electricity in this belief that we can make it all renewable in the long run. But right now, that's why you get zero for a battery electric vehicle. It doesn't matter whether it's fueled by electricity from a power state, a coal-fired power station or not. It's zero as far as the politicians are concerned. In the UK, we have a Z, uh, the ZEV mandate, the zero emission vehicle mandate. This is additional to all the stuff that goes on in Europe. Uh, and they, you, manufacturers selling cars in the UK will be fined uh, for each non-battery electric vehicle that they sell below a mandated target. The fine is currently set at £15,000 per vehicle. Right? That's more than a vehicle if it's got an internal combustion engine. It's about seven to seven, no, it's more than that, 171,000, the comma's in the wrong place, 171,000 SAR fine per vehicle if you don't hit the target. And it only applies to battery electric vehicles, not plug-in hybrids, as we call them. So it's only battery electric vehicles. That is the first year. We're in it now, right? We're supposed to hit 22% this year of, the, of, of, of cars sold in the UK should be electric. We'll come back to that in a bit. But let's make an, an observation on equitable responsibility. So the OEMs, because of the tailpipe CO2 emissions regulations, have nearly all of the responsibility for decarbonizing transport placed on them, right? despite the fact that they do not profit from the sale of the carbon that is emitted. Right? The people who've profited from that are the fuel companies. And they have really, really simple uh, uh, limits put on them with regards to decarbonisation. To me, that seems really unfair. Iniquitous. It is iniquitous. Um, in no way does it align with the maxim that the polluter should pay. Okay? Uh, I'm not saying that the OEMs should not be charged with increasing the energetic efficiency of their vehicles. They control that. That is what they control. What they do not control is the carbon intensity of the fuel that is put in. Okay, so we need to dis we need to disconnect those two things if we're going to carry on like this, a sort of life cycle analysis approach. The fuel companies, as I said, they've got pretty easy legislation raised on them to decarbonize their product. In reality, they don't have to do much at all. But a bit of biofuel in in Europe, and you can get around it if you're a car company. That's despite them being a, uh, it being a massive profit generator for them. And we need to get to a point where fossil fuel is better left in the ground. And I know that's a really difficult thing to say when I'm standing in Saudi Arabia. Okay, but that is the reality. Yesterday in the news, CO2 emissions are accelerating, right? Loads and loads of people have some really weird things to try and reduce CO2 emissions, but it's absolutely true. If you burn fossil fuel, you emit fossil CO2. It's as simple as that. So in the long run, obviously, mankind is trying to get to this point where we don't get the stuff out of the ground and we don't burn it. And where are we now after all that legislation? So this is the tailpipe CO2 progress for cars in the EU. Not working. Um, so the red blob was a voluntary target that the manufacturers said they'd hit. Sure enough, it was voluntary, so they missed that. 
uh, and then the EU said, right, we're going to have some real targets. So they brought in the first of the white blobs. Uh, and you can see all of a sudden with threatened fines, we hit that. OK, but there's some quite interesting things here. Over those 20 years, the CO2 emissions from the cars went down by 37 percent. So anybody who worked in propulsion in uh, the auto industry in that time can give themselves a pat on the back because we did a really good job. And we not only did a really good job in terms of straightforward CO2 emissions, the cars got more powerful and heavier during that time. They're still much heavier now. That's because everybody seems to think they need to walk around, ride around in an SUV. The reason why there's a disconnect there is the EU switched the drive cycles to report all this. But you can see a few things. Basically, it's flattened out in the last five years. And that's despite increasing numbers of, of BEVs being made with zero tailpipe emissions. Why has that happened? Because everybody wants an SUV and they're much less fuel efficient. And in Europe, we started to really demonize diesel. And diesel is actually damn good for CO2 emissions. Right? So uh, various things happened in the background, but you can see from this, it's getting really difficult to try and hit these CO2 emissions. How good is electrified vehicle sales? Well, actually they're not going anywhere near where we need to go. Uh, we're, we're the, the as far as the politically set targets are concerned, the charts on the right there are 12 month moving average. But basically if something stays flat or goes down, you know, that's really bad. And you can see in Germany, it's got a real problem. They're not shifting any electric vehicles in Germany. And remember the manufacturers have to shift them to avoid the fines, okay. So how big are those fines? Well, yeah, there could be 13 billion a year, what Renault say. 13 billion. Um, fines could reach 51 billion euros by 2030 overall, if, if nothing changes. So you wonder what the future for the European car industry is. According to Renault, they have to try and sell 20 to 22% just to meet the emissions targets this year. And it's around about 15%. So they're well short. So these are calculations for fines uh, for individual OEMs. Volkswagen, anybody following the news at the moment? They're in a real mess right now and they're facing these level of fines progress towards our mandate in the U uk so that top line is the 22 percent line that's what we have to hit by the end of this year that is the average throughout the year the uh, cumulative bev sales effectively uh, average average it's not cumulative average sales throughout the year so we're a long way off we're not even hit 18 percent yet and there's only two three months to go to get to 22 percent will surely hopelessly miss that and then if you do a calculation if you assume that you get to 19 percent which we're nowhere near then three percent of the total cars that might be sold 1.9 million in the uh, in the market you can calculate the fine 855 million pounds 4.1 billion sar not a surprise that many manufacturers are talking about just leaving the uk and think about that what that means for any country that has a car manufacturing base. So there's a collapsing EV market. Chinese competition is, is intense uh, because government subsidies and, the, and they control the supply chain. So their cars are massively cheaper. The EU and the US have already imposed huge tariffs on, on Chinese manufacturers. Uh, and that limits the growth of the battery electric vehicle sales, which is really what we want. So you've got this horrible circularity going on. Western OEMs have a collapsing market share in the Chinese market. A lot of that is because Chinese, Chinese buyers no longer see Western cars as worthy of the premium. They are not as good as they can make them themselves now. But why would you buy a Western car? There's a general slowdown in sales in Europe because of all the stuff that's going on geopolitically. And Europe's, in, Europe's auto industry itself faces oblivion, basically, if we carry on like this. Uh, for all sorts of different reasons, you can read them on the screen. It's broadly the same problem in the US. Okay. It's not quite as pushed by the legislation, but it's essentially the same. So massive problem for Western OEMs. Uh, Volkswagen, Porsche, Stellantis, these big companies, Stellantis is the one that formed between Fiat and Peugeot in the world of manufacturers across not only US, but also Europe. They've all cut their earnings or sales forecasts. Mercedes just reported a 31% decline in BEV sales. They can't shift them, they're too expensive. Uh, plus a halving of profits. Porsche announced 41% drop in profits yesterday. The picture on the uh, on the right hand side is from yesterday's Financial Times. Right, Volkswagen talking about having to close three factories in Germany. They've never closed one before. Layoff, 
more workers and slash pay by 10%. That is not going down well in Germany, which is, of course, the biggest uh, economy in Europe. They've actually just had to announce a potential recall of 33,000 battery electric vehicles because of faults in the batteries. I don't, know, I don't know why anybody wants to make a battery electric vehicle. There's so many problems reported and it has to be put right forever afterwards. It's just, I really don't understand why they want to do this. Uh, because, of course, they won't be allowed to sell anything if they don't. But anyway, new battery manufacturers going bankrupt or they're in dire financial straits. So we've got all of these companies that have tried to set something up really quickly. And they found out, you know what? Industrializing things is pretty difficult. Mining companies who are trying to supply this, they've got this really big shift in supply and demand. And they're all pulling out. Then everybody wants them. So they pile back in and it's, oh, it's just horrible. We're all trying to do things far too quickly. There's a market failure driven by a failure of just politically hoped for um, the development of a battery electric vehicle market. And that just hasn't happened. Why has it happened? Well, it's basically, it's a chicken and egg scenario, although we call it the electric vehicle RIP problem. Uh, that's not entirely meant to be just humorous at the expense of the electric vehicle people. There's a reason for that. So basically, you have the first problem, I think, although it's chicken and egg, is probably the infrastructure. There are real shortcomings in the public charging system. So people want a long range in their electric vehicles in order to avoid having to interact with it, okay? Because it's hopeless. Price, that pushes the price up. I told you that batteries were really expensive. You build a bigger one, it gets much more expensive. So that pushes the price up so that then the government has to pull in the subsidies. Now, remember I said, all of this is entirely funded by historically by private capital. It's not in the model for governments to pay you towards buying your car, right? That is just historically not the case. So now they're having to provide subsidies. So government can't afford those indefinitely. So they've had to be withdrawn. They've done that in, in, in Germany and that's caused the collapse in the market. The sales then fall and that pushes up back the price of the vehicles go back up. And then there's no money left over to fund uh, the, what's needed in the infrastructure. So you go round and round and round this problem and the reason we call it RIP is because you've got range infrastructure price okay and it's just a horrible, a horrible situation it's essentially due to the very poor cost utility ratio of a battery electric vehicle versus the stuff that we all have at the moment right so although you might think it looks like a really old device and ha 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 look at that the battery electric vehicle is the equivalent of your smartphone Sorry, the uh, internal combustion engine vehicle is the equivalent of your smartphone in terms of what it does. And the battery electric vehicle is like going back to a tethered phone in comparison. The consumer still has a choice and they vote with their wallet. But then again, you can also bring in the idea of the social contract. Where is the social contract from the government? They're trying to force something on people that's nowhere near as good. Right? So uh, it's not a surprise when, when you have a choice, people don't buy them. Why isn't it bio? Well, this lack of a te technological neutrality in CO2 regulations, right? They've chosen a winner. Battery electric vehicles are the winner. It's the only thing you're going to be allowed to have in the future, according to legislation. Major problem with this is that politicians listen to scientists and not to engineers. I'm sorry if you're a scientist and you're offended by that statement, but there is a real problem, right? Scientists are not like engineers. We are different gravy, okay? Scientists obsess about efficiency, yeah? And they use that single metric to shoot down any alternative that's not as efficient, okay? They do not understand things as engineers do. You need cost, robustness, and scalability before you need efficiency, right? If you're going to make a product for the mass market, the cheapest product wins. And actually, I can underline this, I love internal combustion engines. I really, really love them. They are hopelessly inefficient. I will accept that. They are really appalling in terms of the en energy that you pour in the top and what you get out to move your vehicle. It's about 20% efficient when you're driving it around. Four-fifths of the fuel that you've paid for just disappears in heat. It doesn't move you. I accept that. Why is it dominant? It's cheap, right? Simple as that. Many of the advisors they use are really ideologues who would just do away with the internal combustion engine. It's obviously bad. It's obviously old. Dieselgate, you might have heard of that. That really didn't help, right? And that's at the root of Volkswagen's problems, actually. But I'm not going to talk about that in any, any further. Most companies, though, were not cheating at all. Okay? 
There's only Volkswagen, and that was used as the reason to really go after battery electric vehicles. So the subsidies wasted on battery electric vehicle sales would actually have been much better spent just piling into the infrastructure. Make that good before you try and sell people battery electric vehicles. So it has the minimum effect on them. If you'd made it good, we could all have had smaller batteries. But you can't. That's the only way out of the, of the, of the problem, is to, is to have smaller batteries and cheaper cars and a better infrastructure. So the actual problem. Right, let's remind ourselves what the actual problem is. The real problem is that we operate vehicles on fossil fuels, okay, because they're cheap. Economically affordable cars and engines don't have to use such fuels. It's a horrible irony that both diesel and Ford made their original engines run on biofuels because there really wasn't much fossil fuel around. Okay, so people think that you have to run a car on fossil fuel. It's not true. Right? The engine doesn't know where the carbon came from that's in the fuel. It really doesn't. It has no sentience. We made the engines and stuff run on fossil fuels instead because it was cheap. The planet only cares about life cycle CO2. It does not care a jot for tailpipe CO2 emissions. Right? It only, can, only concerns itself, if it does indeed do that, with the rising CO2 in the atmosphere. How it happened doesn't matter. We need to find a way of getting at the huge amounts of renewable energy that we have in the world. We have to find a way of making it usable in existing vehicles. So required upstream energy, right? You get about a thousand watt per meter squared during the day in a desert. You do a quick calculation and you work out that an area about the same size as Riyadh could, if it was, a, if it was covered in uh, solar, pa solar panels, actually provide the same energy that the European transport fleet uses. So it's not a very big area. That red square, is the ex that exceeds the world's energy needs, right? All of it. This is the total reserve, the total amounts of reserves that we have for all these different things. So the small box on the top is actually how much we use. Then we have oil, we've got more gas, we've got still more coal. And actually, if we could get all the uranium, we would have a load more than, 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 than the coal, gas, and oil. That's fine. But the box, the massive box at the bottom is the annual solar energy that hits the planet, right? It's not the total reserves. It's just what hits us annually. In actual fact, the rate at which we hit, you get the uh, energy from the sun is well over 1,200 times what we use for everything. Okay. You don't need to be massively efficient with what with this stuff hitting us before we could actually decarbonize everything. So what would be an ideal scenario? Well, it would be really good if we could make a liquid fuel that goes into a car uh, that uh, gets us towards a zero carbon end game. If that could be used in all the cars, that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, other factors, we'd like it to be scalable to full amounts. We don't want to run out. So that's the problem with biofuels, which I haven't talked about. But biofuels, there's a limit in every country. We need stability in the taxation system. We need to have something similar to what we have now in terms of technology, book vehicles, because they're affordable. And if we could only just find a way of unlocking all this other abundant energy around the place, that would be really good. So you can achieve this using carbon neutral liquid fuels. Now, they have different phrases that people turn around. Basically, they're called synthetic fuels, electrofuels, or e-fuels. Those are all terms that are also used for the things I'm talking about. So you can solve the problem by the fuel path. You can do it by going through sustainable methanol. There is our friend, the methanol molecule. Okay. So first off, you need a lot of renewable energy. You essentially electrolyze water to get the hydrogen, and you combine that with CO2. Ah, right, okay. Now, so we have got some carbon in this thing. But where does the CO2 come from? Well, to make it fully renewable, Come on in a minute. Uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You burn that stuff. If it's methanol, you can also make gasoline, etc. You burn it in the cars, the existing cars. They emit the CO2 into the atmosphere. And the way you make this fully renewable is to extract it from the atmosphere. OK, that is very sci-fi. I, I can prove to you that it can be done. Right? It might cost a lot, but it keeps everything on the customer side cheaper. Interestingly, you can also turn methanol into, uh, into petrochemicals. So everything else that we get from oil, like computers or whatever it is, can still be furnished via this route. And if you take some of it out, 
that might allow you to you put to burn some carbon still on the other side, or you could take it as being sequestration of the carbon and a reduction in the amount of CO2 that's left in the atmosphere. So the methanol process efficiency, right? So of the all the energy you put in the front, it's about 45% in terms of the energy that's in the methanol by the time you've finished. Importantly, the feedstocks are just water, air, and renewable energy. Nobody gets charged for those. Okay, they're free. Right. And what you make is a high value product at the end. So we're in a totally different place economically. You can also buffer renewable energy by making it into a liquid form, which is basically what we do at the moment when we move around the world with energy buffered in the, in, in the tankers, etc. So we can smooth out supply and demand by getting plants around the world to make this stuff. And you can make all the stuff that we currently use using this sort of approach, right? So you might do it slightly differently, and it won't be as efficient as going to just to methanol. But this is a way to decarbonize all of the types of fuels that we make at the moment. So many people have suggested it. We were talking about it for a long time at Lotus, but we, we didn't say we were the first. Uh, lots of other people have looked at e-fuels one way or another. It's the only way that we're going to decarbonize uh, aviation. So we have to develop this technology one way or another, at least for one thing. Essentially, the EU has ruled them out and chosen a winner. And those, in order to make transportation affordable, uh, we have to do this. And that will also allow us to go into deserts and, and cheap, uh, sorry, poor countries where we have a lot of the renewable energy, but we can't get it out. We can get it out as liquid fuel and transport it away. So actually, this is potentially a highly disruptive technology for battery electric vehicles. So I say we've got to keep internal combustion engines right, because it's affordable. And we have to keep liquid fuel. We can use liquid fuel fuel cells for certain applications. They're actually engines, too, if you look at the definition. We have to adopt a sensible level of plug-in electric. I won't really talk about that, but, but, but using some electricity in a battery on the vehicle makes some sense at some point. But we have to incentivize or coerce people to pull in, to, to plug in. And we need to fuel these engines on carbon neutral liquid fuels. I said we have to decarbonize, do this to decarbonize aviation anyhow. So it might be expensive, but it is a silver bullet because this approach would decarbonize everything. Okay. So there is a silver bullet to it all. It's just people don't want to do it. One last thing could we use fossil fuels to find a way out? So this is a bit left field. We could put a global tax on fossil fuel usage to offset fossil CO2 emissions, right? Been openly suggested by Shell. You use this money to fund global carbon dioxide removal, right? Um, and the reason it makes sense is that it's cheap. The fuel is cheap. You're doing this, you pr uh, produce a reduction in the net CO2, so it becomes net zero fossil fuel. You effectively fund one half of the electrofuels infrastructure by doing this. Right, concluding remarks. I say the internal combustion engine and the car is a towering achievement of uh, mechanical engineering. And that's because of its cost to utility ratio. In the last hour, we've made sufficient cars with a value of over $300 million, right? I know I've been talking for too long, but that's the value of my speech, okay? Successful technological revolutions have only ever improved that ratio, right? So whatever you choose, it's only ever got better. The electric vehicle effectively reverses it for most people, and that's why it's being rejected. Climate change issues mean we have to decarbonize transportation. But what we're doing at the moment and the imbalance in responsibility is just not conducive to doing that. And the current approach, electrification, is a significant uh, risk to the economic model. Now, here I am saying this. Instead of banning the internal combustion engines, actually governments should set a deadline for stopping the sale of fossil fuel. Give everybody some certainty in that direction. Oil companies have lobbied against this sort of thing for a long time, but it's becoming increasingly counter counterintuitive because we're going to have electrification whether you like it or not. Better for them to actually support liquid fuels one way or another because they already have the infrastructure for delivering it. And we need to focus on life cycle emissions of, C of, of CO2 uh, and a logical approach to taxing energy. As I said, the planet really doesn't care where it comes from. And that way you can at least all the stakeholders get some kind of improvement. Governments don't have to pay for stuff. Fuel companies can continue to sell stuff through their inf infrastructure. Vehicle manufacturers have a similar technology they know they can make money from, and transport customers can still afford motoring. And you can't lose sight of that. 
They're the only financial input into the system. Any technology which is not perceived by the customer to be at least as good as the one they already have is going to fail, right? And that is definitely happening now. So what has been attempted now is already being referred to as a gross misallocation of capital. We're not going to get that money back, right? We should have done something different. We need technological neutrality. Actually, this is the last slide. The EU has finally accepted that they need to allow e-fuels in some form. But what they've said is they can only go into engines which cannot take fossil fuels. Why? You know, if you put them in, if you make them equivalent to what we have at the moment, they can go into everything. But that, to me, says that they're really about getting rid of internal combustion engines. But anyway, that's my uh, paranoia, if you like. But it will give some certainty to people who want to develop these things now that you can sell e-fuel somewhere. Right? And now, increasingly, other people in Europe, Fuels Europe, Italian government, other people are saying, whoa, hold on a minute. We have to have these things, and they have to be able to go into everything. We need to go for all the solutions. And that's me done. And I'm just going to point you to some ancient history, right, why I'm standing here. 2007, I wrote my first papers on e-fuels and why electrification would not work in the long run. OK, we need to do e-fuels. Those two papers were published in January 20, 2007, 17 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. This was a very interesting seminar. I would like to give you a gift in the name of the Group of Students for right. Sustainability and Office of Sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. See Thanks. you soon next time. Thank you.